Welcome into the Thunder Basketball Universe. It is our first pod postseason, which is crazy to think about. The wild ride of this year and the ups, the downs, the highs, the lows, and an incredible run through the postseason in the playoffs for this Oklahoma City Thunder team. And we're coming to you the day after end of season interviews. So we've gotten a chance to talk to all of the guys following that series against the Dallas Mavericks. And we got a chance to talk to Coach Dagnall as well. So we'll break all of that down in that podcast. But Nick, what a season for this young Thunder team. Yeah, of course, it's it's painful right now in these days, you know, following the 4-2 to two loss to the Dallas Mavericks in the Western Conference semifinals. Um, but I thought that there was great perspective over the last few days as this team, um, you know, considered what they had accomplished, the youngest team ever to earn a number one seed in the NBA, uh, in the NBA playoffs, the youngest team ever to win a playoff series. They won 4 nothing against New Orleans. And, you know, I think if you'd pulled back and you'd gone back to October and asked people, hey, what would you think about a uh, second round, you know, getting to the Western Conference semifinals and being right there uh, with the Dallas Mavericks team that had really pushed all of its chips to the center of the table? I think that t- people would have been astonished at a 57 win team um, and, and having the opportunity to be in that position. So um, once again, uh, the runway is long and there's a lot of excitement here in OKC. Man, a lot to be proud of as well. All right, we have a lot of things that have made us look over these last 48 hours, really more like week, really, um, with everything that went down in that Dallas Mavericks series. So, Nick, I will let you go first. What made you look? So there was a stat that jumped out to me uh, that I heard during some of the postgame media veil on the night of game six, which was a stat that went a little bit like this, 636 to 636. And that was the final score if you tallied up all the points in the six games between the Thunder and the Mavericks and just goes to show how competitive that series was. And I think a great lesson has this Thunder team climbing that second mountain, as GM Sam Presti says, you know, once you get what you do throughout the course of the regular season, the 82 games is you put yourself in a position to be in the heat of competition in a seven game series. And the point behind trying to build something with sustained success is it gives you so many more bites at the apple than maybe a one year push in because as we saw this year you can be deadlocked in terms of total number of points scored in a series and you can still lose in six games because that is just the fickle nature of the NBA playoffs and so year in year out you give yourself as many opportunities to have things break the right way to have the matchups go the way that you want to go to have the shots go in that year to give yourselves a crack at it and I think this was such a great encapsulation and such a great lesson for this young Thunder team going through this for the first time that hey sometimes this is how the playoffs go now you know how it feels. You can learn some of these lessons. You can understand you were right there mm-hmm. in the details of the game, the moments that matter. Those are the things that, that can take you over the edge next time you're out there. I love that you brought up this stat because you could look at a 4-2 to two series and be like, oh, well, Dallas really, they they really outplayed the Thunder. Yeah. And, you know, <laughs> uh, OKC only got two games. But if you look at the scores of each of those games, low scoring, mm-hmm. it was back and forth. The The lead changes were crazy throughout some of these games. And the Thunder in game six had the lead for a very long portion right. of that game before Dallas went on a massive run in the second half. And so it really goes to show a how close this series truly, truly was. And really like to your point, how fickle the bounce of the ball can be sometimes. Right. And in this case, in for Dallas, the ball just kind of bounced in their direction a few more times. And I think a good indication of that as well, I believe it was game five where the Thunder lost in game five, but it was the Thunder got so many good looks in that game. Mm-hmm. You remember they had 43s attempted in that game. And that's an indication that you're getting looks, you're getting good looks, but they didn't fall, you right. know? And like, that's just sometimes how it happens. And it goes to show also the defensive effort by OKC throughout this series as well. A lot of low scoring matchups. And even though the Thunder didn't necessarily have their fast pitch throughout multi- a multitude of these games, their defense kept them in it and gave them a chance. Yeah, I mean, to hold, first of all, in the series before that, to hold New Orleans to under 95 points a game in that series yeah. was sensational. And then this Dallas team with two you know, future Hall of Fame guys in yeah. Doncic and Irving, like the fact that you were able to keep those guys under 105 a bunch of times in that series, uh, obviously the, the last game, game six, was a much more high scoring affair as both teams were starting to figure out some things about the other one. Um, but it, it just goes to show 
um, you know, these games are in these series are on a razor's edge, you know, yeah. one play, uh, two plays go differently in game six. And suddenly the Thunder's headed back home with this series tied three to three and home court advantage in a game seven. And so uh, there's just so much hanging in the balance in yeah. these situations and such a great learning experience. And so I feel like that number six, uh, 636 is 636, uh, really nice encapsulation of what it means to be in the postseason altogether. 636 was also like my heart rate throughout that entire yeah. <laughs> like, game five and game six. It was absurd. I was stressed out going through it <laughs> throughout the fourth quarter. Paris' phone was lighting up all night. <laughs> oh my <laughs> sitting there up I can't in the take top it. row. Yeah. <laughs> I can't take it. My watch is telling me to yeah. like calm down, take yeah. a breath. Uh, but yeah, just an incredible seri- series, super competitive, hard fought for the Oklahoma City Thunder um, and just indicative of, of an incredible season as well. All right. The thing that made me look actually made me look while we were walking into the building today to record this podcast. <laughs> we're recording this on Monday, May 20th, and the league announced today the all rookie teams and both Chet Holmgren and Kaysen Wallace were named all rookie teams. Chet named to first team all rookie and Kaysen named to second team. And I just I think this is goes without saying Chet an obvious, obvious great yeah. contributor for the Oklahoma City Thunder throughout this year. Played all 82 games throughout the regular season. And in post-game or in end-of-season interviews, he was sure to make sure everybody recognized the five preseason games yeah. as well. <laughs> add those and then add the, the 10 postseason games as well. So this man has played a lot of basketball. Plus, 90, 97 games. 97, to 97 yeah. games total for those doing the yeah. math. 97 games. Didn't miss a single one. Same goes for Case and Wallace right. as well. And their endurance, their motor, and their impact. To, they, they weren't just going out there with flat minutes every single night. They were going out there and really contributing at a high level each and every night. So an incredible, incredible recognition for them. But th- they don't need that to validate the incredible season that they had. Sure. No surprise. But it, it's always great to you know see that recognition and, and for people outside of uh, this thunder bubble to see how bright the future is here mm-hmm. in Oklahoma City. I mean, Chet, uh, 17, 8 guy, two and a half blocks a game, shot at 53% from the field, 37% from three on the season. And, and something that Mark Dagnalt said to us at end of season interviews is like, hey, this is probably the, the lowest yeah. level of Chet Holmgren that we're going to see in his career, you so know, for the next 10 about. years, at least 15 years, possibly, you know. And so that's really exciting to just think about, okay, wow, where can Chet Holmgren yeah. continue to go and continue to grow from here? And, you know, he obviously was right there in terms of a contender for rookie of the year all season long. Yeah. So no surprise there. Case and Wallace um, played all 82 games, but had a, a little bit more of a defined role for mm-hmm. this team. And so really nice also for the league to recognize what an impact player he was yeah. on both ends of the floor, his offensive stats in terms of pure production, maybe not going to jump out like crazy, uh, but the efficiency and what he was able to do in those minutes, 42% from three, really, really impressive. And he told us in those end of season, end of season interviews that this is probably the best that he's shot in yeah. his career, really. And so he gave a lot of credit to the Thunder coaching staff for helping him really hone that efficiency throughout the season. Great stuff from Case and Wallace. And not to mention the defensive impact both of those guys right. had. Chet Holmgren with the awesome offensive stats, but just a rim protector, a deterrent for all guys. <laughs> just making them second guess and hesitate their decision to drive downhill and try to get to the rim. And Case and Wallace just, I, I feel so bad. I feel so bad for those, you know, really strong ball handlers out there who are getting hounded by Lou Dort yeah. each night. <laughs> and then they they breathe a sigh of relief as they see Lou Dort go to the sidelines only for Case and Wallace to check in. <laughs> And be like, oh my gosh, more of this. There was a meme that one of the Thunder players posted earlier in the season yeah. where it was like, I don't know, it's these two guys and uh, oh, there's one standing behind the other and one guy flips the other over his back and like replaces him and they're, I think they're twins and they look, yeah, like, they look, look the exact, exact same. And, uh, and I think it was maybe Jay Will that posted it. Yeah. But it was like, you know, when, <laughs> when Lou Dort checks out and Case and Wallace checks in and it's like that, that's what you want. You know, sometimes yeah. NBA teams look for, versatility. And of course, that's great. You want to have a lot of different options, but sometimes um, having some redundancy on your roster is a good thing Mm -hmm. because it provides you a a clear identity and style of play if you 
realize that, hey, in the first unit and in the second unit, we can have a guy go in there and yeah. replicate what we're able to do. No better example than when J-Dub went out uh, of a game in the New Orleans Great series point. on the road and Casey Wallace steps in, plays big time minutes in the first quarter, basically starting 15 seconds into the first quarter, I think of game three. Yeah. And it was a, a wonderful display of that next man up mentality and some of these interchangeable parts that the Thunder has. And it goes to show also when those two are on the floor together, it's just like an awesome defensive yeah. juggernaut out there. It's it's in, it's incredible to watch. And to see the growth f- by Chet and Kaysen throughout this season, incredible. Mm-hmm. Knowing where they started, you know, seeing them in summer league to now contributing at a high level in intense, high stakes playoff basketball. Yeah. And both of them fearless. I mean, we saw so many plays where most rookies would be, you know, deer in headlights, maybe second guessing themselves. Kaysen knocking down massive three pointers yeah. in fourth quarters. Chet Holmgren knocking down massive threes and blocks and dunks. All of this in the most high stakes moments. And it just goes to show the mentality of these guys. Absolute pros. And of course, just ultra competitive players out there on the floor. And just makes you so excited. I mean, these right? guys, uh, these guys obviously need to digest and they need to, to sit back and they need to get their time um, to, to relax. But man, does it get you fired up about next season already? <laughs> I'm so fired up. Yeah. So fired up. All right. We spent, I would say approximately eight hours yeah. yesterday at the Thunder practice facility, getting a chance to talk to Coach Dagnall and every single one of these Thunder players during end of season interviews. And so we had a couple of things that stood out to us Mm -hmm. over the course of those eight hours that we're going to share with you here today. We're going to start with Mark, um, Coach Dagnall, and some of the things that really popped out from his interview. He talked for about, I would say, 30 minutes, roughly, um, and some really great perspective as always with coach Dagnall. I mean, even following game six against the Mavericks, he had some awesome things to say there as well. Just really made me feel better, you know, yeah. <laughs> yeah. sitting there and listening to him. But um, one of the things, and it's a common refrain that we heard throughout the entire postseason and even throughout the regular season, a refrain that we heard from coach Dagnall is this is an uncommon team and we want to be an uncommon team. That means uncommon maturity, uncommon poise, um, uncommon competitiveness, all of that, which is required for the youngest number one seed in the Western Conference in NBA history to be able to accomplish what they did this season. You have to be uncommon. And the results of this season are, are a result of that. Right. The ability to play with poise, the ability to come back from deficits. Once again, this mm-hmm. is now two years running that the Thunder has had the most double digit comeback victories in a season, 17 yeah. once again. Uh, the ability to play in crunch time. They went 24 yeah. and 14 in the clutch this season. And, you know, a, again, st- you know, stole a game on the road in Dallas that. You know, many people would have said they had no business winning. They just stayed in there, hung in there uh, in game four to, to even up the series. So um, a couple, you know, big time wins on the road in New Orleans too. a closeout yeah. win that they I mean, these things don't just happen. You know, th- th- this is all intentional. This is all yeah. um, stuff that's developed and, and thought about and yeah. really invested in over the course of the season. And that that's what makes this group so special and one that you, uh, you know, it's so clear why people root for them. Uh, the way that they do and why they um, feel so positively about this group moving forward. And one thing that Coach Dagnalt said about kind of breaking down what made this group so uncommon, he said, you know, most NBA players, when they come into a team, they can see themselves as kind of independent contractors, right? right? My job, I'm going to come in here. They brought me in because I'm X, Y, Z, and that's all I'm going to offer and I'm out. And or I'm going to focus on what I need out of this team. And then I'm, you know, that's all I need. That's all I'm worried about. And what made this group so uncommon is that they gave up a lot of their selfish ambition. They gave a lot of themselves, honestly, to Mm -hmm. focus on what the group needed and the needs of the the team as a whole. And when Coach Dagnall says the whole is greater than the sum of the parts, this is exactly what he's talking about. You know, because NBA players, they have a lot around them. I mean, Mm -hmm. when they go home, they've got people relying on them. They've got, you know, agents and people with good intentions, you know, adding some pressure to their careers and, you know, their performance. And for these young guys to be able to block a lot of that out and just focus on what does the team need for me? Right. You know, Aaron Wiggins, for example, if, am am I starting today? Am I coming (laughs) off the bench? Am I playing five minutes? Am I playing 35 minutes? What's, what's my role today? I'm ready for whatever you need. And just offering himself as, you know, a, a really big asset to this team. 
that's what all of these guys are about. And that's what he means by this is an uncommon group. And the maturity for a team full of guys who are still either on their rookie contracts mm-hmm. or contracts as a you know second round pick or an undrafted free agent, yeah. that makes it even more remarkable because these guys – you know, compared to other players in the NBA, compared to your um, veterans who have made, you know, who are on their second or third or fourth contract in the NBA, these guys don't necessarily have that financial fo- foundation totally locked up yet in yeah. their lives. And there's so much more pressure on them at this stage of their career to, you know, get yours and, and you know, make sure that you solidify what your role is going to be in the NBA. Go, you know, try to be a superstar, try to be X, Y, and Z. Um that's why the the stereotype is that, you know, veterans later on in their career mm-hmm. are the ones who are more willing to sacrifice because they have that, you know, security and right. whatever. This is a, a total, you know, flip-flop of that um, stereotype as yeah. this team is actually uh, wild, has has shown a, a maturity wildly beyond their years and their, their stations in their careers. And I think it's easy for these guys to buy into it because they've seen the benefit of it now right. going right. through multiple seasons of being – you know, team first. Mm-hmm. Well, look, look at you now. Look, look what that's gotten you. And this brings up another thing that was a really big theme from Coach Dagnalt's press conference was he was really encouraged by the process of this team, mm-hmm. not just this season, but really over the last four years for this group. And he brought up a really good story yeah. um, from his first season with the Thunder about an, an arena walkthrough that he was talking about. Yeah, this was the moment that really stood out to me in Paris. I, I just still think back to the fact that, you know, this was only your second year yep. with the team yep. when this happened. <laughs> yeah. And like, it just feels like so long ago that it's hard for me to believe. But basically the Thunder, you know, uh, sometimes if it was like a, you know, an early tip off or second night of a back-to-back or something, they would come to the arena early and have mm-hmm. a, a pre-group, pre-game walkthrough before the fans uh, were I- even in the building. And so... You know, during that time, Paycom Center is just empty, you know, 18,000 yeah. seats uh, waiting for fans to to come in later on that night. Well, in that first in that season, there were no fans even coming into the right. building at all because of COVID. And Mark Dagnall had the foresight, you know, having been here as the OKC Blue Coach to talk to these guys who were struggling in that year, um, you know, that there were no fans in the building and, and some losses had piled up. And he said, hey, I want you guys to know because I've seen this play out here in this city, in this building before, what we're working on right now, the habits that we're investing in, the mm-hmm. principles that we're living by, all of this stuff is going to be what what puts t-shirts on each and every one of those seats in a few years time. If we continue to invest in these things, we are going to get the outcomes that we want. Yep, It's a matter of trusting that process and that whenever we're ready for those outcomes is when they'll come to us. And that's exactly what's happened uh, here. It, it all came to fruition. And Mark explaining that story, I thought was so great because it gives an insight to this not just being a singular season, this being an accumulation of seasons that, that have come before it. And the t-shirts on the seats isn't a result of just this season. Right. It's a, a, to your point, the habits that stack cumulative, mm-hmm. cumulatively over time compound over time lead to the results that we see here today. And for Mark to also bring up Shay, Kenrich, and Lou, those were the guys. And Mike Muscala. And Mike yep. Muscala, mm-hmm. that's right. We're the four guys that are on this team now that were on that team back yeah. four years ago. And those being kind of like, the, the ringleaders to help kind of establish some of these habits, keep right. hold teammates accountable to these habits throughout the year, stacking year over year over year. And look now, t-shirts yeah. all over those <laughs> seats inside of Paycom Center. It, ga- it kind of gave me, it gave me some chills when Mark told that story. Right. right. It's just, you know, there's calling your shot in a, you know, braggadocious or bravado way. And then there's also like laying out a plan and laying yeah. out a vision. And I think that's something that the Thunder organization, you know, from up top, with the you know the governor Mr. Bennett mm-hmm. and uh, Sam Presti and Mark Dagnall, who's you know basically been a lifer in the organization, has been <laughs> yeah. raised by this team and organization. They have an understanding of the type of vision that needs to be laid out in front of a, a group of men to not just um, you know motivate them or inspire them. These guys are intrinsically motivated, but to show them uh, you know a clear vision of what is to come as they continue to invest. Uh, to give them, you know, a, a challenge or a goal to work towards, and, and these guys are motivated and fueled by challenges. They yeah. they live for them, and also yeah. give them a 
be very clear about what's required yeah. in order to achieve that goal. Yeah, standards, that's right. Because yeah. it was not easy. <laughs> Let's yeah, be yeah, very clear. Yeah. It was not a step-by-step -step process. There were ups, there were downs. It was hardly linear for this group over these four years. But it was the compounding factor of just sticking to it, sticking with it, stacking days, stacking practices and games, stacking seasons, and then the thunder where they are today. Yeah, and I think this ties back to what you were talking about with the uncommon team and mm -hmm. the togetherness of it is like when you set a vision like that, what you're asking the players to do is compete, but not compete against each other, but compete against the standard. Yeah. And that's what makes the ability to root for the the guy next to you who even might be getting more minutes than you or you might not be getting any minutes at all, makes it a lot easier to root for that guy yeah. when you're competing together against a standard that you're aiming for as opposed to you know competing against one another for a role or for minutes. And because the Thunder did that, they are where they are today. T-shirts all over the seats and Coach Dagnalt with some incredible coaching and foresight. Mm -hmm. This is why he was named Coach of the Year this right. season by his peers and by the media. No doubt about it. Just an incredible coach for this Thunder team. Okay, let's get into some player takeaways since we talked to sure. every single one of these guys. Um, there were a couple of key themes that I, that I wanted to bring out. And the first one is the fans. Yeah. All of these guys so incredibly grateful, appreciative of the fans and the response from the fans this season. Because I think it's very clear that this group feels a strong sense of connection to the community and to Oklahoma City, the, the state as a whole. And I think a lot of that reared its head and showed itself during the playoffs when, you know, these players are walking off the airplane yeah. at one o'clock in the morning on a school night. Yeah. <laughs> and there is a mass of fans at the airport barking at them. Yeah. You know, like that goes to show just how connected, you know, the Thunder is to the community. But also it was very clear for the Thunder, I think, you know, as they were going to New Orleans to experience their playoff environment in Dallas, experiencing their playoff mm -hmm. environment. They realize there's nothing. Yeah, nothing that compares nothing to this. Nothing yeah. compares to Paycom Center. And so it was funny. Mike Muscala, who an 11 year veteran, mm -hmm. <laughs> brought up. He said when he was sitting, uh, he was sitting on the bench in Paycom Center during, I, I believe it was round one. Yeah, it was yes. one of the yep. first playoff mm -hmm. games at home. And he looked over to one of the assistant coaches for the Thunder, and he said. I've never experienced anything like this in my 11 years playing in yeah. the NBA. And, and this is a guy that's played in the playoffs for other teams. Yes. He's been a part of other, you know, historic franchises. He's played in Los Angeles. He's played in Boston. <laughs> he's played in, you know, Philadelphia. He's played a lot of places yeah. in Atlanta, you know, and uh, for him to say that was really remarkable. That says so much about Oklahoma City and Paycom Center. You know, last night after Mike said that, it, I – my wheels got turning a little bit uh -huh. as I was leaving the practice facility. And, and um, I was reminded, and I really want to commend the Thunder fans for operating in the way that I'm going to kind of describe here. But uh, there's an infamous quote from Michael Jordan. Uh, he was asked, you know, how are you able to get to this competitive level every night, 82 games out of the year? And, and Michael's statement was, you know, I go into the arena every single night thinking there's someone in that building who's this is their only chance to see me play yeah. ever in their lives. Yeah. And I kind of got to thinking about inverting that in terms of how the Thunder fans maybe recognize that this team, this group of guys, they have not gotten to experience the playoffs before. Mm -hmm. They have not gotten to experience what it's like to be in a playoff run here in this city. So many of these fans here in Oklahoma City, they've been through a playoff run before. They've stood up and they've delivered to these teams that you know fought through wars here in the playoffs over the last 15 years. Yeah. But these guys hadn't. And so for the Thunder fans to go and do what they did this, this spring and deliver that experience to these players really reminded me in a little bit, a little, some ways of that Michael Jordan quote of like, hey, you know, we nothing is given in this league. We yeah. don't know whether these guys are going to get to experience this level of, of fan interaction, this level of engagement from fans. So we have to show them this. Uh, they deserve that. And, and the players do deserve that. They earn uh, every bit of that love and support. It was a let's give them this full playoff yes. vibe experience, excitement. And Thunder fans, you showed up. Yep. You delivered. It was amazing. Even for me, I mean, just my first playoff, just experience it, being an observer and all of that. 
absolutely unparalleled, unmatched to anything I have experienced ever before in an NBA arena. Yeah, so cool. Incredible. And because of that, it leads to another big theme that jumped out at me during these post game or these end of season interviews. And that was the fun that this group had this season. The barking, the post game walk off interviews with Nick Gallo, the closeness of this group. Everybody was just, it was great vibes, great vibes on the floor, off the floor. But it was so interesting because when these guys stepped onto the court and it was time to tip. The, that basketball up and the clock started running all business professional as ever which goes back to this group being so uncommon because they can joke they can be jovial they can have fun all this high energy you know light air and then when it's time to be about business they are about business but in, in the quotes yesterday at, at end of season interviews i mean we you know tried to ask each player about yeah. this aspect of the team because it it just seems so unique and so different from uh, what you see from the other 29 teams in the league. And of course, other teams are close too, but this just seemed so unique. And I think that we hit almost every single type of emotional connection Definitely. or wavelength that you could from these guys. And we, ta- we heard from Jay Will saying like, I can joke with these guys even – more than I can joke with my brothers. Like I can <laughs> ask, I can say anything to these guys and, yeah. and you know that it's going to be all good and you can mess with guys. You know, we had Josh Giddy talk very openly and frankly mm-hmm. about, you know, some of the ups and downs that he had this season and how he wouldn't have made it through this year without the support of his teammates, without the way that they, you know, reached to him and, you know, were there for him in so many different ways. Um, he said it was kind of like therapy, getting a chance to just go be with my brothers every day. (laughs) Yeah. I mean, Shay, you know, talked about becoming a father for the first time and, you know, how all of that was uh, related to just being with his team, with these guys every day. And of course we know Lou and Shay are so close as well. So there were just so many different uh, emotions that we got from the guys to describe Mm -hmm. what this is like to be in that locker room and a part of that team. Shay had an incredible quote. Speaking of him, he said, this group is in OKC has always been really tight and it definitely made a difference in our performance and togetherness. But then he said, I've never been this close to a basketball team in my life. Yeah. And then he added, maybe my AAU team. <laughs> when <laughs> maybe. He was 15 when he was 16, 15 yeah, yeah. and he was playing high school basketball with those guys and then going yeah. and playing AAU a little bit later in the day with the same guys. And so that just goes to show, I mean, to our point, these are NBA players. You know, they've got circles of their own. Families. Families, lives, all responsibilities, yeah. mm-hmm. all of these other things. But this is this is their family. Yeah. These these are their guys. And I think it really helps, obviously, that they're all, you know, so young around the same age. But also when you make it about the team and you focus team first, this this it lends itself to this level of togetherness. And I, I don't think this goes you know, I don't think this surprises anyone that we're saying that this group is so close. Right. But it it's very, very clear, like this group loves each other they genuinely enjoy hanging around each other being in the locker room being on the court going to practice every day how many guys said it was a joy to show up to work every day that was like one of the massive quotes that stood out to me it's like yeah this is work for these guys they're showing up every single day but it didn't feel like work for them yeah i mean these guys all are gonna have a chance to go on vacation do whatever they want to do but every single one of them said yeah i Really wish that we were having practice today. Yeah. You know? and like, um, I, I think that's a really good sign. All right. So another big theme from um, the end of season interviews, these guys, lessons galore mm-hmm. from this season. And obviously one of the big things that we heard throughout the year was that every you can't waste an experience. Right. These guys are soaking up lessons from every win every loss, every every time they stepped out onto the court. And that gets heightened, of course, when you get into the playoffs and every game carries so much weight. And right. that's the first time you're going through it as a team. And so there were so many lessons and takeaways from that first playoff experience. Yeah, I think, I mean, from the micro lessons of, hey, you know, a team switches up from, uh, you know, one type of defensive coverage to a zone. Yeah. And we got to get good looks immediately. We can't have, you know, two or three possessions that falter to, you know, The smallest of things like, you know, the way that you close out to the corner. I mean, Shea Gilders Alexander Mm -hmm. took that last play of game six so hard. Of course, every single one of his teammates and Mark Degnault said, like, that wasn't the reason that we lost the game. Right. But I think all of these players, Chet really highlighted this as well. All of these players 
really had something to digest mm -hmm. from the series. Josh Giddy in particular was like adamant, like I am not going to allow what happened in this series to happen again. And uh, I think that that gives the, these guys a level of focus and determination heading yeah. into an off season that they might not have had without this experience under their belt. They kind of, you know, next year's opponents, if they are fortunate enough to make it to the playoffs could be completely different. They could get guarded completely differently. Right. But what will remain the same is the level of pressure, the level of scouting, the level of um, just intrigue and intense focus on uh, every minute detail of what's going on. The environment. Yes, yeah. and, and that is what they can learn from here. And Coach Dagnall said after game six, he said, it's painful, but our challenge now is to turn this pain into growth. Right. And that's what this group is all about. That's what they've always been about. But you learn so much from losses, as we heard from yeah. Shea Gilgis Alexander. You learn more from losses than you do from wins. You can always learn from wins, but it's kind of hard to extract the lessons after yeah. you get a great outcome. And so going through this experience, going through this loss and this just, you know, painful, painful loss is going to be really good fuel and growth for the Thunder. And as we've seen every offseason, these guys get after it. Yep. Uh, so many guys. And keep in mind, these are all very young players. And young players tend to make massive strides during the offseason, especially first and second year guys, and come back a, a kind of a different guy than, than they left at the end of the season. Yeah, and it just, I think, again, strikes you like, most teams that have this type of postseason experience don't have the number one, no, excuse me, the number 12 pick in the draft coming up the mm -hmm. next year. They don't have key players who are heading into, you know, effectively year three or year two um, in, in their NBA careers coming into the next year. So um, you just have so much time yeah. uh, on your side in terms of growth development. These are the formative years and these guys, you know, the summer's a little bit shorter because of what they did, but they're going to have summer league. Some of them are going to have yep. um, the the Olympics to go play in. Uh, these are going to be massive experiences for them. And there's just a lot to look forward to. And it's very encouraging, you know, as a Thunder fan to look at mm -hmm. this group now, look what they've accomplished, see how hungry they are, see all of the experience that they've gathered up. And to know how competitive they are, that yeah. these guys are basically, we've heard from Chet, Shea, Josh, all of those guys with like pretty direct quotes that say they plan to live in the gym yeah. this offseason. <laughs> That's the goal, yeah. <laughs> live in the gym. Yeah. So it'll be really interesting to see what they get into throughout this offseason, which leads us into what's coming up next yeah. for this Young Thunder group. So keep an eye out because in the next few days or so, in the coming days, we will also hear from Sam Presti, the Thunder General mm -hmm. Manager, in his annual end of season interview as well. And so we will have a podcast following that. And then keep an eye out on your TBU feed because we will do a breakdown of each player as well and, and their season and kind of do a wrap up on yeah. all of our guys and, and what they've been up to, what they've done this year and the growth that we saw from them this season. It, it's going to be great to really take some time to dive into each of these players. They deserve that. Yeah. They deserve um, to be celebrated for the year that they put together and to look ahead at some of the things that they mentioned are going to be focused focuses for them heading into next year. So I'm really excited to dig into those and to provide our fans some more content here because yep. just like the players, all of you wish that they were, you know, gearing up for game seven today or and at practice yesterday. <laughs> I know. So we've got more content coming your way. Don't you worry. And then of course the draft, we've got summer league mm -hmm. there and the Olympics things will be happening yeah. this summer that the TBU will be covering. One last thing, just because yes. you mentioned that general manager Sam Presti is going to be talking. Mm -hmm. um, that'll be, you know, sometime in the next you know, coming days, but this is always a great opportunity for Thunder fans who really want to understand the direction of the team. If you have lingering questions as to, you know, why did things go this way? What's coming ahead? Yeah. Sam is very transparent in these talks. And so uh, he's not going to leave you wondering about the direction of the franchise, what this yeah. franchise wants to do, where it wants to head um, and, and what it values. So be locked into that. We'll have full coverage of that for you at OKCThunder.com whenever it comes. And don't you worry. We got you covered yeah. on everything that you need to know. Thank you so much for watching and listening all season long and keeping up with this Thunder crew through the TBU. Thank you so much to our producer, Matt Bishop. Be sure to like, rate, and subscribe wherever you get your podcasts. And until next time, Thunder up and catch you later.